It's uh, Dr. Seth Kimmelhoff. So he is the chairman of psychiatry at the uh, UK Health and the, and the Kentucky Medical School, the University of Kentucky Medical School. So we are honored to have him participate in our meeting. I think this is uh, Seth's very first TCOM uh, conference. So wish we had been in person, but hey, at least we're all together. So uh, I'll give the floor to you, Dr. Hamilton. Well, John, thank you very much. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here today. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I do want to um, begin by acknowledging the, um, the people I'll be presenting with, Liz Cromry. Um, who is in Texas, and Shelly Paul, who's in San Diego. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting with them shortly, I mean, uh, for a little bit last night, and learning a little bit about what they're going to be presenting. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to share this roundtable with them. Um, the focus of today's um, presentation is really thinking about um, how the COVID pandemic has affected um, telehealth and, and the utilization of telehealth. And I think we're going to do it from three very different perspectives. Uh, I'm gonna lead with um, really thinking about it from a mental health perspective uh, as the, ex the experience of um, switching or pivoting to telehealth um, in an outpatient psychiatric um, clinic in Kentucky. And I've, I've titled this presentation, Disruption Leading to Innovation, Pivoting to Telehealth During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, and the reason I really wanted to stress disruption leading to innovation is that, at least in my experience, um, trying to get clinicians to change formats, to move from face-to-face -to, -face to telehealth, um, was very challenging. Um, so one of the pre-pandemic limitations of implementing telehealth, um, at least in my experience, that were, were really generated from provider concerns. Um, and there were numerous concerns. Um, one had to do with appropriate training um, do I, so I get questions like, do I need to be trained to do this? And if so, how much training and what type of experience or expertise do I have to develop before, you know, you should let me on a telehealth, um, you know, uh, to, to use a telehealth interface. Um, the second part had to do with technology. Um, some people were just frankly technological phobic uh, and didn't want to bother with, you know, learning what, it, what, what you needed to learn in order to engage with the technology in order to do a, a telehealth visit. And connected to that was concerns about whether or not patients would be comfortable with the technology and whether or not they would agree to do that. There were also um, you know, important questions about privacy, whether um, you could, and, and you can, have a HIPAA you know, compliant telehealth interface with a patient. Um, so there are some concerns about that. And then there are, Concerns connected to that about safety. Um, what happens if somebody um, is suicidal and you have them on telehealth? How, how are you going to get the client to the appropriate urgent or emergent resources needed? Pardon, I, I don't mean to cut you off. We can't see your presentation. Uh, oh. Yeah, I think you need to stop screen sharing. Oh, here it comes. Perfect. There we oh, go. Sorry, I just stopped it. Um, Brad, so, yeah. Share it again? Yes, please. Yes. All right. Thank tell you. Me Tell me when you can see it. Sorry. There we go. There we thank go. you. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. I could see it. <laughs> um, and connected to the safety concern was um, another type of privacy concern, which is on the patient side. You know, um, we like to, we in mental health and I think in physical health, like to have, you know, the doors shut and be in a safe and private space. Um, could that be, you know, um, clearly replicated in a, uh, an environment where a person might be uh, not in their house, maybe in their car or in the bus or something like that. So there, there were concerns about that. Um, and then rapport was a big one, whether or not you could develop the same type of rapport um, with a patient using telehealth um, as you could in face-to-face. Um, -face. And in particular, could you see the clues and cues that one normally does, pick the, picks them up during a, an encounter with a patient. And then the last part was reach, whether or not um, given if all those other things could be dealt with, whether or not you know patients would have the appropriate technology, could they upload the app to their phone? Um, would they have stable broadband, uh, especially in rural areas? Um, and so all those things um, were barriers to getting people to uh, get on board with doing telehealth. 
And then this amazing disruption happened. Um, the COVID pandemic arrived in, in America. Uh, and this is a New York Times front page. The you know, World Health Organization cites a pandemic as a disruption, as a disruption sets in. Um, and this is from Thursday, March 12, 2020. And then if you look down toward the bottom of the news, the, the, the front page, you see colleges tell students to pack and go. And I think we all can remember that time in March being really concerned about what we can do safely. Um, we, there was mixed messaging about mask wearing. We thought that you needed to do social distancing, but that was a strange and odd idea. Um, we didn't quite know like how it was spread, although respiratory was clear, but you know, could it be fomites and other things? So you know, people were taking appropriate precautions and in all of that, of course, New York was having that surge. I don't know if you probably all remember, um, you know, this terrible surge, which we thought was going to like rapidly go across the country. So the next slide I'm just showing you, this is the tracking of case counts of COVID in Kentucky um, from March 2020 to the current date, which is sometime in October. And as you can see in early, in early March, there weren't many cases, but people were terrified about what could come. And what I'm going to next show you is our clinic, just data from our clinic um, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, and, and, and during that time, I'm going to show you how we transition to telehealth. And again, keep in mind the idea of disruption leading to innovation. So here is March 9th. So on the x-axis is weeks. It goes from March 2020 to June 2020. And on the y-axis is the number of people we, we saw during that, that, that week. So um, unique encounters. So th these are not, um, these are just individual people, not the number of appointments. So um, what you can see here first in orange, that's the face-to-face -face visits. And you can see that over the period of two weeks, we went from 121 unique patients to a le less than half of that, so 50. And that, that just shows you how much concern and, and, and difficulty people were having with, should I come for a visit? Providers thinking, should I have a visit? Um, and many of those things, the reason we had such a decrement was due to cancellations. Um, and during that time, we all strategically pivoted and thought we need to do something to continue our access for these people. And the obvious solution was telehealth. And we did have a telehealth platform but out of the numerous clinicians that we have in the outpatient world, we had very few who were experiencing telehealth. Um, but during that two week period, we rapidly implemented a training and stood up a, um, a platform to do HIPAA compliant uh, telehealth services. That required an enormous amount of work from both the providers, the staff who have to reach out to the patients to schedule this and also training for the patients to know how to access it. And you can see here in blue, oh, so we did the transition on March 25th, and you can see here in blue, that's the number of telehealth visits that we then um, completed. And you can see the first couple of weeks here, the transition was a little bumpy um, as we got up to speed, training, teaching, learning, um, getting all the bumps out of the system. But I think what you can appreciate up here is that we were able to stabilize it pretty well and looking over here, when we had 121 visits, you can see here we're having a lot of visits that are higher than that because the demand was high. And also people were canceling less often because in fact, over time, they appreciated the um, ease and reliability of doing telehealth services. They didn't have to drive to the clinic. They could schedule a time that was good for them. Um, so there, there was a lot of satisfaction. Um, and on the provider side, there was a lot of satisfaction because we could let people go home and work from home um, and do the telehealth work as well. You'll note down here that the face-to-face -face visits during that time period went to almost zero. So we were doing like nearly 100% telehealth. Um, and this is really the best indication I can share with you of disruption leading to innovation and getting all those concerns that the providers had pre-implementation were sort of wiped away um, in a period of two weeks. So as you know, as we move forward in time in, in the pandemic, um, in the late early winter, um, the FDA did agree to have an emergency use 
uh, um, uh, author, uh, authorization for vaccines. And so that allowed us to feel a lot more comfortable um, going back to face-to-face -face visits. Um, and so we had to plan for that, um, how we were gonna do that in a safe and effective way. Um, and these are just some points that we needed to work on based on our own community standards, our own state and local regulations, and then the UK healthcare systems guidance and all that. So all patients who wanted to be seen in face-to-face uh, -face had to be screened for COVID-19 symptoms. Um, and then we had to be particularly cautious about waiting areas and offices to maintain the social distancing. Um, so we tried to minimize any waiting rooms. So we would have people, like this is old school, we don't do this as much anymore, but be in their cars and register them and then tell them to come in. Uh, all patients had to wear face masks, all providers had to wear face masks and eye protection. We had to have appropriate social distancing in offices. And then every office had to be clean between visits. So it was very arduous to do this, but we did it. Um, and, and over time, um, more and more people became accustomed to coming back to face-to-face -face visits as the pandemic um, changed. So the shape of the pandemic obviously went down considerably in the spring. Uh, and that's when we started building up that practice about patient face-to-face -face visits. Um, and as you know, we are now in the period of the Delta spike. Um, and during this current term period, I just wanna share with you kind of what things look like now. Um, so if I show you, this is our um, a description of face-to-face, -face, which is in blue, uh, to the um, telehealth, which is in orange. And you can see over the last three months, as we've moved into the, um, the Delta spike, uh, about 60% of people on average are choosing to maintain telehealth, um, or 40% are coming in face-to-face. -face. And some of the face-to-face -face appointments are needed, especially if you have to do some sort of vital sign check or something needs to be examined, or um, you're working with uh, children, which is an interesting thing in and of itself. Um, you know, play therapy is not really effective on telehealth. It's very challenging to do that. So how does one do play therapy with a person? Um, and, and, and that becomes a different uh, question that our, 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 our group attempted to answer. Um, so you can see, I think, from this that although we had this robust movement toward telehealth early in the pandemic, um, when the shape of the pandemic changed, more people are immunized, and the comfort was better to bring people back in for telehealth. Uh, that's what we did. But you can see a significant number of people, the majority actually, maintain their uh, kind of allegiance to telehealth. Um, and it is a very popular and satisfying um, part of the services that we're doing in the outpatient domain. So in conclusion, I would say this disruption leading to innovation, um, we did a rapid telehealth transition that led to, I think, increased levels of satisfaction both for providers and for patients. Um, in a very quick and um, an increased level of the adapt adoption of the technology, which as I said earlier, there was a lot of concern about that, but um, that was addressable. Um, we've noticed a decreased number of cancellations. So our number of patients that we're able to provide care to has increased because we're not losing those spots to cancellations. And then we've had decreased missed appointments because um, people are scheduling at times that are convenient for them um, in their best environment, which most of the time is in their home. Um, but I will say it's not for everyone. Um, you know, even though we did this rapid transition and I suggested that we had that 100% at that time, um, it didn't meet everyone's needs. And there are groups of people that I do believe still require face-to-face -face visits um, and probably get the best, um, you know, treatment from that. So this hybrid of telehealth and face-to-face and, and -face is really what we've landed on. And I think it's working really well for us right now. So that, that's where I'm gonna stop. Um, and I guess I could, are, are we leaving questions to the end, Brandon? That's, that's completely up to you all. Um, if you would like to take questions, if folks have those questions, um, you can certainly do that as well. Liz and Shelley, what would you prefer? Yeah, would you I like think to... it's helpful if anybody has any questions now. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share. I have uh, one question, which is, so if, if you're thinking about who benefits, who doesn't benefit. So some people, it sounds like maybe do better actually with telehealth and some 
folks need to be face to face. Uh, do you think your your clinicians or you have a clear sense of how to sort that um, moving forward? Is there is there some guidance that uh, that could be developed out of these experiences to kind of give people some idea of which to do for whom? Yeah. So um, one of the so uh, from our pers from the perspective of the outpatient clinic, it's been a very individual decision. We've left that to the provider and the patient to kind of decide what was best for them. Um, and then th that, but what I've learned um, is that there are some, some people that, um, you know, for example, uh, if, if, if people are hearing impaired or, you know, that could be very challenging uh, to do this type of, um, you know, a telehealth uh, um, uh, appointment. So for people who have that, 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 that has been a challenge and it's been easier, I think, for them to meet in person. Um, for people who have broadband that's not particularly um, you know, reliable, that's been a huge challenge, uh, both for the provider and for the patient. So that, that's another group that's probably preferable for them to come in. The, the, the disadvantage, of course, is that those are often the rural, people in rural environments that are the farthest to travel. Um, so kind of, and, and maybe that's a plea to get better broadband services into their areas so they can do it. They have to go to the Walmart and sit in the parking lot to have the therapy session. There you go. Um, and, and so there's, you know, all sorts of privacy and concerns around that. Um, and then finally, um, there's patient choice. And there are some people, and I haven't heard this as much from the providers, but there are some people that feel they just do better in a face-to-face -face situation rather than on telehealth. And I, I don't know what the predictors of that necessarily are, except to say that the one case that really came, uh, a therapist highlighted to me, was an elderly woman whose only social contact during her week mm -hmm. was really to come in for her psychotherapy visit. And um, that whole motivation of her, you know, her getting up, getting out, coming, talking, leaving, was so helpful to her um, that losing that by telehealth, you know, was 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 a big problem for her. So, um, so there there are, you know, issues that are connected to it, John. But I, I don't I don't know that I have any categories to share. But I do okay. think trying to discover what they are would be important. Anecdotally, I'm hi. I'm Caitlin Gothrop. I'm from Massachusetts. Um, I have an in home therapy person that I work with. Um, and uh, he's particularly paranoid. So uh, during telehealth in the winter, there was a lot of this and a lot of sneaking and it really didn't seem very productive. And it seemed like it was scaring him more than it was doing anything. So we, um, we decided to go into his home um, with a lot of PPE, but you know, that's what we ended up doing because it just wasn't sustainable uh, due to his fear of the camera. I, I think that's definitely the right choice. And again, as I, as, and, I'm, and thank you for bringing that up because I think it illustrates that it isn't for everyone um, and that one really has to make a, a very individual decision, right? Um, to decide if that's gonna work. Uh, another domain where we had some challenges is in substance use treatment um, for some of the more stable folks in our um, substance, substance abuse treatment program, um, the, the telehealth was fine. But for some, especially early on, it's really important to have people come in and we have urine testing and things like that. So um, it became a little bit more challenging to imagine how to do that or how to have groups that were effective um, using telehealth, which we've learned to do. But um, for some people, it's, it's much um, more challenging to do that. Um, especially if people are, you know, not engaged, right? So, um, so, so it does present some challenges. And so thank you, Caitlin, for bringing that up. Linda, did you want to give your comment out loud? I think it's an important one. Yeah, I was just indicating that um, some of my clients have a hard time um, focusing on the screen for long periods of time. Like they have ADHD, so they, I mean, they're constantly getting up, moving around. Um, and if they're on a computer, that's really difficult for them. And then some folks too, like with the anxiety, like there was one I know, because 
we do concurrent documentation to like, what are you typing? What are you doing? What, you know, why aren't you looking at me? Um, so there's some, you know, anxiety that goes along with that too. And so I've got probably about 10% of my caseload that actually comes into the office because of those things. Interesting. So is, has anybody found or South, have you noticed, is there some group that actually do better with telehealth or is the best we can do kind of, at least it's not harmful? Um, yeah, no, I think there are people that um, prefer it and actually get very good outcomes from it. Um, and I, I, again, I have no, I, I haven't done any research on this, but um, I'm just cautiously speculating and people can tell if I'm right or wrong about that. Um, that, you know, adolescents in particular, you know, and early in people who are in their 20s, I mean, they, this, you know, this thing, <laughs> this thing um, is kind of, you know, attached to them. And they're just very used to, you know, um, working with that technology, um, connecting with their friends and peers and everyone through it. So it, it, in some ways, it's very seamless to their life, you know, to, to do that. And my, my guess is that it's just part of an expectation that, yes, why wouldn't you be able to do, you can do an appointment with many things, why wouldn't you be able to do it with your providers, right? So um, that, that's just a, you know, a guess. But again, I, I don't have any data to suggest that's true, but. Right, that actually describes my son. So he has bipolar disorder and he had got, he finally found a psychiatrist he really liked in Brazil. When he came back, he just continued with that psychiatrist and just did it via phone, right? So it would work just fine for him. He liked it actually, so it's interesting. But yeah, it sounds like oftentimes it's actually counterindicated. Is that uh, the consensus? I don't know if that's my consensus. I know you're probably not asking me, John. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, I have I have a couple of outpatient clients. I don't prefer it. Like I don't prefer telehealth, me personally. I'm also an in-home therapist by um, philosophy and design. And I think that might also affect my answers. I do know that this one outpatient kid I've been working with for a really long time, it was very refreshing and soothing and great for both of us to be able to connect virtually when we couldn't connect in person. Um, and we've connected in person again recently, but then he had a major surgery. And so then today we use telehealth to check in, which he wouldn't have been able to do if we didn't have that because he would have had to like get out of his house, which he can't do. So I, I, yeah, I don't know what the consensus is. Yeah. Todd, I, I personally, I think it's here to stay. Um, and I think that as long as the insurance companies continue to provide payment for this type of intervention, I, I can't imagine that people are gonna go back. Um, and I think you're right, you know, it, one has to make the, the right decision if it's for, you know, if it's gonna enhance treatment or hinder it. Um, and one would only know that by, you know, trying it out and seeing how it works yeah. for a particular case and then pivoting if you need to. Um, but I don't know what others think, but my, my sense of it is that this is going to just be part of the business as we move forward. Do you think CMS will continue to allow more flexible payment? I, 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 I really do think so, because I think it's been a big satisfier for, um, for patients in particular. But I also think there's this goal of like in, in engaging better in the rural areas, um, which I think you know for mental health, it's been really a challenge. And if we got good broadband that was reliable, um, this could be a, you know, a game changer now. Now that everyone's trained up right, to do it, um, it's, it's really possible. In the past, it was very challenging because one of the barriers was that the providers didn't necessarily want to do it as I indicated in my first slide. So, 